The advice and opinions live in her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavior intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we're webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. Welcome. It is Tuesday. We're so glad to be back with you live. It feels like we've been away for a long time, but thrilled to be here. We're going to be live for the next two hours talking about autism from a 360 degree perspective. If you found yourself here and uh, you've never been before, I want to welcome you. And I know, isn't it strange that we get excited about, oh, we're going to talk about autism for the next two hours. Was there a time in your life when you didn't think you'd be saying that with an excited voice? Yes, there was in my, my life as well. But we know that if you are a parent, teacher, practitioner working with an individual who is on the autism spectrum or you yourself are on the autism spectrum, that there is a wealth of information that's out there if you can access it, if you can get access to it. And once you do get access, to it, then there's all kinds of progress that can be had. This can be a very interesting, not always wonderful, but sometimes wonderful journey. So we do talk about autism from, as I said, that 360 degree perspective. How is it affecting you in terms of your emotions? How is it affecting you in terms of getting things done? How is it affecting you in terms of finances and everything in between? And we talk about them here. This entire show is meant to be interactive. We want your input. We want to hear from you the kinds of things that are kicking your keister or that you want some answers to. And we hope that you will participate with us. Emily is going to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us here. I'm going to remind you that one of the ways you can watch us live is at www.autism-live.com. When you go there, you have the opportunity to watch the most recent show that we did or go to the playlist and pick what you would like to watch, what kinds of subjects you're interested in. There is also a white box that is there that we try to keep open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And you can, when it is active, you can put your cursor there, hit, uh, you know, type whatever you want, hit enter. It shows up here on my screen that I have an, uh, an opportunity to discuss it with some of the experts that we have here on the show and I also have the opportunity to uh, talk to you now I want you to remember that I'll come in like, like over the weekend you guys wrote in a bunch of things and some of you are doing a great job of telling me what specifically you want answered or what you're watching on the show that you have a question about. Try to do that because otherwise I don't have a context to what you saw that led you to ask that question. And also want to remind you that that feature is free. There is no login at all. We're not asking for your name, your credit card number. We don't even know where you're writing from. So when you're asking questions about services, always great to put in where you're writing from. So it gives me a reference point to start with. Otherwise, that will probably be the first question I ask you back. And if you want us to get back to you directly, it's important that you give us some sort of information, whether it's a phone number, an email, a snail mail address, whatever you'd like. Um, we won't share that with the whole audience. I have a way of editing that out before we get up that up on the screen. But I hope that you will take advantage of all the different ways or some of the different ways to watch us and to get a hold of us. And I also want to urge you, if you see something that you like here, share it. Share it with a friend. That's what helps us to keep going is knowing that more people are getting this important information. Uh, we call ourselves the little show that could because I believe that we can and uh, we want to make a difference. I am not an expert in autism, but I'm a mom and that's why making a difference is so particularly poignantly important to me. My son was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. 
you know, one of those days that I had not seen coming and it changed my life. Somebody asked me the other day, I was being interviewed and they said, you know, what was it like? And I said, I think of my entire life as what happened before that day and what happened after that day. And, uh, I will tell you that a lot of amazing things have happened in my life after that day and I have a different appreciation for what I need to be grateful for and for the relationships that I have in my life. And so there have been some happy and joyous things. There have been some days <laughs> which I talk about from time to time. You know what I'm talking about. There have been days where there were a lot of tears and they weren't the happy kind, right? Um, but I made, uh, Nancy Allspot Jackson talks about the kitchen floor club. I made my kitchen floor deal on a particular day that I was on the kitchen floor in tears and said, okay, I want to do whatever I can to help my child, help my family. Please help me and if uh, if I'm able to do that then I will gleefully turn around and help whoever I can to sort this out for themselves I'll use that knowledge and that's why I am here I have a lot to pay forward so take advantage of, of the people that I have access to on your behalf ask the questions and I'll hunt them down it takes me a while sometimes but you are not in this alone and by the way there are so many people I, I get the privilege of sitting here and talking to you but there are so many many people who are in your corner that you don't even know that are staying up late at night trying to figure out how to help you with the circumstances that you go on in your house. You have no idea, but I'll remind you of it from time to time. You are not alone in this. You really aren't. Uh, there's lots to do. Don't let it overwhelm you, but there are a lot of good people in your corner. You'll have to take my, my, uh, my word for it sometimes, but that's okay. My word is good, as, uh, especially on that subject. All right, we like to start every morning with something that we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. We do this because when you get a diagnosis of autism uh, or you begin to work with individuals who have autism, it really is uh, like Alice in Wonderland going through the mirror and you find yourself in a different place and people are speaking differently and they're using different words and it can be very frustrating because you're there because you want to create progress. Uh, you want answers, but sometimes the answers come in a foreign language known as jargon. So instead of being overwhelmed by it, we want you to take it one word, one phrase, one acronym at a time and start to begin to make sense of what these terms mean in their, the context of autism, right? Okay, so today, this is one that our experts talk about a lot and we don't share this jargon enough. Uh, this phrase is joint attention. Now, for those of you who, ha who have arthritis or uh, any kind of thing where you've hurt a joint, you think, oh, we wanna pay attention to our joints. Uh, that is not what we're talking about when we talk about it with autism, but it's a very important, uh, step that a lot of our kids miss and that if we go back and catch them up on this particular skill, it will become a prerequisite for so many skills down the road. What is it? Let's look at our actual definition. The actual definition of joint attention is the process by which one alerts another to a stimulus via nonverbal means such as gazing or pointing. All right, let's look at our working definition. The ability to share attention with another person toward an object, person, or event. Eh, they're both kind of sketchy, right? <laughs> Okay, so I always make the little triangle here. Uh, so imagine that you're sitting, let's think about it in terms of adults first. You're sitting there with another adult and you're watching a television show and you're sitting on the couch and watching it and something happens on the television show and you, you're looking at the television show, having your experience of it, right? But what do you do? You turn to the person next to you, you make eye contact with them because it's something shocking that's happened on the TV. The two of you look at each other and then you look back at the TV because you want to keep track of what's happening on the TV, but you keep checking in with each other like, did you just see that? Oh my gosh, wasn't that amazing? And sometimes you just point to it and make eye contact. Other times you just make the eye contact, raise your eyebrows, but you have a moment where you're sharing the attention 
attention to this thing. It becomes a triangle of attention. Uh, the TV's here and the two people sitting here. You're looking at each other and you're looking at the TV. We do this in life all the time. We make eye contact with somebody and look at something, whether it's to be like, do you believe she just said that? Um, or isn't that amazing, right? It is a conversation that often has no words, right? Um, but we gauge sometimes how we react to the other thing based on what the person is that we're making the contact with. So that's amongst adults. Let's take this to uh, the level of development with a child. So here is the baby and the baby is in their little bouncy rocker and mom is talking to the baby and you know, go blah, 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 blah. And dad walks in and dad says something. The baby looks at dad, mom looks at dad, and then mom and the baby look at each other and they're like, it's daddy, right? They're sharing that joint attention with daddy. Now, what we know with our kids with autism is a lot of times our kids aren't doing this because it's not reinforcing enough for them. I don't know why. I'm not going to pretend that I know why, but when we lose this step or this step unravels or it's not reinforcing enough to do it on a regular basis, what happens is an important chunk of language development, of social development, of perspective taking is broken. Uh, language is going to stem from this moment. All social reference and deciding how to feel about things and how to pursue things and, and noticing what other people are feeling all start from this tiny little skill. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, oh my goodness, my child doesn't do that, uh, and you feel that uh, going on, just realize this can be taught. All we have to do is make it really reinforcing. And it may be that there's a, a step or two or three before this step that hasn't occurred as well. Uh, what's so important is that we figure out where our child is missing, where the, the missing link is, and that's where we begin teaching. So it may be that a child needs to work on stimulus orienting before they can work on joint attention, that they need to be able to put, they need to be able to look at and go, look at this pen, and we would make it much more exciting than a red pen, right? Uh, we would make it, you know, some kind of toy or something that they can look at the toy and they can orient their eyes to look at it, right? Uh, then from there, we can work on dividing their attention so that they're looking at the toy that's so exciting, right? And we're rewarding them for that and that's fabulous. And then we do something to get their attention and then we look at the toy together and we reward them for looking at us and looking at the toy. And then if we do that enough, we will see that the child will begin to do it themselves. But we have to be really conscious and separated from other things. If you're thinking to yourself, oh no, why didn't I do this? This was my fault. No. Um, until you know that it has to be taught in that way, very specifically without other distractions, it wouldn't occur to anyone to do it that way. But if the child is deficient and behind in it, and it doesn't matter whether they're 18 or 18 months, we can go in and teach that skill and it will have a cascade effect with other skills. It is a prerequisite for so many of the things that we wanna teach our kids with autism. So joint attention, really good jargon, a skill that we want for all of our kids to have and to have the the ability to be reinforced by that, um, that that is that we get to the point where it's reinforcing in and of itself uh, is where we need to get with joint attention. Okay, uh, so we always have a question of the day for you. And our question today has to do with transitions. What transitions are hardest for your child? What is the most difficult thing for them to go from and to? I can tell you that anything that involves getting out of the car is still hard for my son. We've worked on it step by step and I, I've been going back over it going, why is this a problem? Um, and I think it's that I don't make it immediately reinforcing for him to put the steps together. I probably need to go back and think 
figure out if there's something missing, but um, that getting out of the car, because he gets into such a state in the car, and I can't wait to get out of the car. I get out of the car, and I've got the bags, and I'm you know, standing there holding heavy things, waiting for him to disengage from wherever his place was and to get himself together. It's a lot of steps, even as I'm thinking about it, you know, he has to get mentally present in the cars because he has no responsibility while, you know, driving the car. So he's daydreaming or playing a game or doing whatever. And I have to, and, and I, even as I'm saying this, I'm going, ah, I got to think this through and give him a warning when we get like two blocks away from home and say, we're two blocks away from home. I need you to put away your stuff, start gathering your stuff together. So I can be shoring this puppy up. <laughs> But it is one of those things that I get into the frustration of, oh, I feel like we've worked on this, but obviously not enough, not specific enough. And obviously it's not reinforcing enough for him. And I have to go back and do that work. Um, and then I will get what I want, which is a child who hops out of the car. He does get out of the car now and know that he's got to help with the groceries or whatever the bags are. So that worked, but he gets reinforced for that. So there we have it. In any case, I look forward to, and we will check in a little bit later on the show to find out from you guys on our Facebook page have written to the answer to the question. I encourage you to write on Facebook. It is a way for others to not feel alone. And sometimes we'll talk about, uh, and we've created shows based on what you guys have written in the Facebook pages as the answer to the question. So, uh, I encourage you to take the time. We'll check out a little bit later. We always have a topic for the week that we are working on. And this week we're talking about dun, 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 transitions because, uh, when we can get a child to the point where they make transitions easily, let's not even talk about just children. When any of us are able to make transitions easily and change from doing one thing to another and be productive, man, that is a serious skill. That is something that adds to your life exponentially. So we're going to be talking about how to take your attention off of one thing and be able to put it onto something else for our kids, for us, uh, and to make it through these transitions. I, I remember when my son was in intensive therapy and I would go into another room to try to get some work done and I'd be listening on the monitor and it would always feel like there was this little record scratch moment when therapy was over and I had to get my head totally in the moment with him. Uh, and it was difficult for me until some people gave me some pointers about what I needed to do to get my head there and it involved doing something physical. We'll talk about that in a little while. So uh, transitions, that's our topic for the week. Some of the different things that we have going on today, we have a very special guest who's gonna be joining us in just a few minutes. Shelby J from Interacting with Autism is gonna be with us to talk about an important event that they've got coming up. It's Tuesday, so we have the healthy eating tip of the week. Can't wait to talk about that. And then a little bit later on in today's program, we're gonna be talking about challenging behavior. How, because sometimes the transitions come from uh, and create Create challenging behavior. So we're going to be taking that on. Plus, we have a plethora of questions, and I'm really making it uh, a priority this week to plow through the questions. I, I would love to get all the questions caught up and answered this week. It's my mission. We're going to do it uh, if we have to stay late. <laughs> So stick with us. Our plate is full, but we've got a lot going on that's really great. We'll be back after these messages. from Ataka here to do some more cooking. Are you ready? Allergy friendly fun and I've got a guest. I'm Jamie Davis. Yes, I'm her sister. Today we're all about cooking something really fun and healthy. That's a dessert. We're going to actually use carrots, real carrots, and uh, we're going to talk about how to make the best tasting carrot cake you could ever hope for. So it's really easy. You don't want to buy the carrots that are the baby carrots. Why? Well, those aren't really carrots. What they do is they take carrots, they mush them all up, they take whatever the carrot looks like, they throw it in a bin, they bleach them, 
and they process them and then they have a little machine that makes them into little formed baby carrots. So they're really not born that way. So this is what a carrot really looks like? Yeah. Awesome. Good to know. So I just want to show everybody how to make really simply. We just washed off the carrots. They're really dirty from the farmer's market. And we're going to throw them in to our food processor. So what's good about the food processor um, is that we can go for a really fine grade. So I'm going to go ahead and add the three cups of carrots. Then the next thing I'm going to pull in is our gluten-free, casein-free flours. I'm using a protein-based flour. Um, Bob's Red Mill is great. I also have my flaxseed meal and pure cane sugar that's organic. Uh, I cut it down already so you don't need to cut it again. And one of the reasons why we like to use organic sugar is because, once again, most sugars on the market are bleached to make them look perfect. Yeah, we don't like perfect. No. We like ours. <laughs> that's why we like each other. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we've added our baking soda, baking powder, xanthan gum, nutmeg, and salt. Now, again, why we use the gums is that's the uh, ingredient that actually holds the flour together. Regular flour automatically has that gluten. This is the replacement to the gluten. These are the secret ingredients for the cake itself. Three quarters of a cup of the crushed pineapple is in there. It gives it a beautiful texture and flavor. And now what I'm using is um, the oil. What are your favorite oils, Jamie? I like using coconut oil any chance yes. I get. In fact, coconut oil would be excellent in a carrot cake. Now what I did was I took a, reserved a little bit of the oil and we placed it in the bottom of that pan so it doesn't stick. Yep. But we love the baking stones. Yes. Why do we love the baking stones? Evenly cooks. Yes. And easy cleanup. If you like crispy, you got to get a baking stone. I also feel that they're less toxic. So now I'm going to cook this thing at 350 uh, for about 35 minutes. You really want to get it golden. Let's get it in there. Awesome. So now that we got our cake all done, let's get on with the frosting. Coconut oil. It's probably the best thing in the world you can eat. Uh, it's so good for your brain. It's one of the best oils that we can use. So I'm going to use a third cup of the coconut oil. The goosh. And then we're going to do one teaspoon of um, an organic vanilla, Madagascar, and, and make sure it's alcohol free. And then what we're going to do is add 16 ounces of organic powdered sugar. And we're going to add our four to six uh, tablespoons of coconut milk. I'm using the whisk version here on the KitchenAid, which will give it a nice mix. All right, so if you get any on the sides, you just come on in with your little butcher jaw. And this makes the best frosting for the cake. So we're almost done whipping it up. And voila, we are talking good stuff right here. We have the best situation for the best birthday cake, especially if you want to deal with something that perhaps has a little less sugar, you've got a great cake that no one will know the difference. Now, I'm not a decorator. I don't like to decorate. I just want to eat it, and I don't care what it looks like. Ask my family. I'm a family with autism. I just want to eat the cake. Are you ready to do this? It can be your birthday. Yay! Yay! So to me, oh this so is so good. It's meant to be gooey. As you can see, um, but what I love about this is a great birthday cake with extra frosting to make your kids happy. A little less sugar and a lot of love. So if you have any questions, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at autismlive at gmail.com and on Facebook, Facebook slash Autism Live. And then you can reach me and Jamie and get some more ideas from the taco recipe site. So let's have some more things. We say hi, we say hi. Let's go out, let's go out. Let's go, let's go, let's go out. Welcome back to Autism Live. We have a very special guest joining us live in the studio. Shelby J is here with us from Interacting with Autism. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. So thrilled to have you here. First of all, tell us what Interacting with Autism is. Um, so Interacting with Autism is a video-based website all about um, understanding, treating, and living with autism spectrum disorder. 
And you guys have a really big event that's coming up here in Los Angeles. Tell us about that. Yes, Saturday, September 28th at USC, we're hosting a huge launch event for the launch of the site. All the films are going to be screening. We have experts in the field coming in to do panels, treatment centers from the area that are going to be giving information, pamphlets, stuff like that. Lots of activities for kids, so family friendly free, open to the public. Okay, and where is the event actually taking place? It's going to be at USC on okay. campus in the Cinematic Arts Building Courtyard. Okay, and at the, so people can view some of the films that you guys feature on your site. And the what, what kinds of films are they? So with the three sections, in understanding, we've got kind of, you know, understanding what autism is, prevalence, diagnosis, treatment. We're covering all the different types of treatment, behavioral, um, developmental, speech, occupational. And the living with section is more family portraits. So you get kind of a real experience of how a family deals with, say, bullies or finding activities activities for their kids to do. Great. And so the the website will actually launch on that day? Yeah, we're hoping to put it up a few days before so okay. that people can kind of get a feel before they come to the event, but of course it's crunch time and we've got a lot of videos to finish. Sure. And when people want to go and find the website, what is the actual website? Right now it's www.interactingwithautism.com. Okay. It's not live yet, but if you follow us on Facebook, you'll get updates as to when it's there. And on Facebook, you're interacting with autism? Yes. Okay. We're going to take a short break and we're going to go to to a clip of one of the one of the shorter videos that you and it's absolutely lovely. Tell us what we're going to see. Um, so this is sensory overload, um, an animation film, but done by Miguel Huron for us. It's one of the first films we did, and kind of puts you in the shoes of somebody with autism and sensory processing disorder. Really, very illuminating. So let's take a look at this lovely film from Interacting with Autism. Welcome back. So that was a short film called Sensory Overload, and that is brought to us by Interacting with Autism. We're here with Shelby J from Interacting with Autism. Really lovely short film that really gets to the heart of the matter of what it is like to be overwhelmed with all the things that are happening sensory-wise for a kid on the autism spectrum. And I and I love the the you know that there's compassion from this person that you know we could have had a moment of anger that this child has acted out and and just flailed and things have fallen on the floor, but instead we get this moment of compassion. Yeah, absolutely. We went over the script over and over, running it by people, how would be the best way for her to comfort him? Because mm -hmm. 
touching him when he's in overload like that necessarily yeah. wouldn't have been the best response. So yeah. we definitely had to work a little bit to get that nice moment at the end. So you're you're launching this website that's going to have a, a series of three different kinds of videos. It sounds very exciting. Who came up with this idea? Um, so Mark Harris and Marsha Kinder over at the University of Southern California, they're the principal investigators on the project. Okay. Um, so them with, of course, lots of help, wrote together this grant um, for the Agency of Healthcare Research and Quality, um, which then funded us primarily to be able to cover the different treatments because there isn't really out anything out there that's very comprehensive and comparative for evidence-based treatments. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the project kind of blossomed from there and these other sections were born and films just kept <laughs> getting made, I guess. And so now, are you guys making all these films in-house or are people coming to you with an idea and, and then you help them to make the film? How does it happen? Um, it's mostly in-house. Um, we had, at least for all the treatment films, we knew which, you know, interventions we wanted to cover, mm -hmm. reached out to these centers, took student film makers, student sound operators, um, filmed it, often student editors. We have some of our um, team is actually on the spectrum, so we're getting their perspective. Right. Um, but also filmmakers in the area did come to us. Um, when the Living With section comes up, a couple of those were from people who reached out to us with ideas, asked for help, and a couple of them are actually ones that were made independently, but we found and thought really belonged here. And, and what what is it that you guys would like to see happen from this site? What's the dream? <laughs> um, you know, honestly, I think the dream is we had somebody, um, we've been sending it, of course, to healthcare providers, professionals in the industry, and, you know, somebody wrote back and said that, you know, every doctor needs to see this. Yeah. You know, this is, it's so comprehensive, and it really helps you understand what you're looking for and how to treat it. And so I think for me, even you know, coming into this, not expecting, you know, not being very individually touched by the spectrum. It's already, you know, on a, on a neurotypical level, it's changed my life. It's changed how I'm going to parent, even if my kids aren't on the spectrum. Yeah. And so you mentioned that you're coming from a neuro, so you don't have anybody in your family who is on the spectrum. I didn't think I had very ah. many people in my family. <laughs> um, I did find cousins and after two years of being, you know, head over heels in this, um, my boyfriend is self-diagnosed. <laughs> ah, okay. It is interesting that once, you know, you, you become an, a part of the autism community in any way, shape, or form, it enlightens you to a lot of things that have been going on in your life that maybe you couldn't put in name to Absolutely. that all of a sudden you go oh well that explains that I'm sure that we have all had a circumstance where we have seen a child behave in some way that we didn't understand and here is this waitress that the child flails and it seems as though it's got no to her I'm sure it would seem as though there is no connection to what's happening around but the fact that the the filmmaker has shown us very distinctly all these different sounds that have led to this moment uh, it's sort of like pulling the veil back we, we get to see what's going on. I am really looking forward to seeing the other films that you guys have. I, 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 I can't wait for the launch, which again is on what day? September 28th. Okay, Saturday. so we're coming up on it in just over a week. And the event is on that same day. And for people who want to find more information, again, best place for them to go to get more information about the event? Uh, Facebook.com slash interacting with autism. Okay. We also have the normal website is not live yet, but if you go to interacting.com backslash launch, okay. there is pertinent information about directions, parking, who's presenting. Okay, but the event is free and, and you've got a, a resource fair and a lot of different things going on appropriate to bring children to the event. Absolutely. There's actually going to be a children's animation station, a face painter is coming, the Miracle Project is going to perform. We're very excited Fabulous. about them. Very exciting event. Well, I'm thrilled for you guys. We wish you nothing but good luck on the launch, and we can't wait to hear how things go. Thank you. Thank you so much <laughs> for being here. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back more with Autism Live after these messages. Hey, guys. For the month of September, I figured I'd show you guys how to make a task completion chart to help your kids get through the hardest parts of the day. Parents have been writing into our host, Shannon Penroth, the hardest parts of the day are waking up in the morning, after school, and getting ready for bed. Please keep in mind you can always modify the task completion chart to focus on the skills that your family needs most. The template we'll be using today to make the task completion chart you can find at facebook.com slash autismlive. Alright, let's get to it. The materials you'll be needing are 
the template, cardstock, scissors, hole puncher, glue, pipe cleaner, Velcro, and photos or images. We find it more reinforcing for kids if you use images of themselves doing the tasks that you're trying to get them to complete. So what I have here to start off are photos of myself doing all the tasks that we're going to add to our task completion chart today. The first step you're going to be doing is printing the template from facebook.com slash autism live. I have it here and the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to trim at the top. We don't need that, that's just totally excess. Now that I trim my three templates, I'm going to label each one with a different part of the day that we're focusing on, such as waking up, after school, and getting ready for bed. Now that I've finished labeling the templates with the appropriate time of the day, I'm going to attach the photos that go with it. For bedtime, the tasks I chose were getting ready for school, putting away toys, putting on pajamas, and brushing teeth. Now I repeat this for all the rest of the day. Now that I've added the photos to the template, I am taking this along with my heavy cardstock to hold all my tokens. I'm going to line them up and make three hole punches. I'm going to take this pipe cleaner and attach the pages together with it. We're almost done putting this together. Next, I'm going to take my Velcro. I'm going to put them underneath each picture and then I'm gonna add four on the very edge too. Now that I've attached the rough set of the Velcro to the template, now I'm gonna take the softer side and add these to the tokens. You can use whatever you want for the tokens, whatever your child finds reinforcing. They could be stickers, images, spacemen, Pokemon, whatever they like. Before you use your task completion chart, it's really important that you do a preference assessment to see what your child finds reinforcing that day. Once you have that established, then you can tell them the rule for how this task completion chart works. So every time they get one of their tasks completed, they add a token to it. And the way the task completion chart functions is like a token economy. So after they put a token under each one of these tasks, they can trade it in for their reinforcer for the day. Now that you've made your task completion chart, hopefully your child will be able to use it on a daily basis and help them through those difficult times of the day. Well, until next time, craft on. Bye, guys. Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back to Autism Live. It's Tuesday, and on Tuesday, we like to do our healthy eating tip for the week. And I always talk to you about how important it is to be eating seasonally. Well, I want to I wanna float something out and, and hear from you guys about what you think about this. But one of the things that I'm very mindful of this week is that while there is so much produce right now, all over the world right now, people are harvesting all these fresh fruits and vegetables. And a lot of times there, there is a moment in the season where there is too much. Uh, and so prices go significantly down for a lot of different things right now. I, a friend of mine posted on her Facebook, uh, she said, I have tomatoes and then I, I have tomatoes that I planted. I have tomatoes that I didn't plant. I have tomatoes that are overrun. It's almost as though they're coming into the house for her. And Obviously, when we grow them ourselves, hopefully we're mindful of the fact of making sure that they're organic, but even the farmers right now have more produce than they reasonably can handle. Uh, the good news about this is, again, that the price goes down and it is very fresh. There are ways that we can take advantage of these times and preserve the fruits and vegetables for ourselves for the long months when it's hard to get things that are organic and they're much more expensive. So I, I want to take a second just to talk about some easy ways that you can preserve things. Last year, I had gone to get organic peaches. I really wanted to have some organic peaches to last for the winter. And I have mentioned before on the show that my mother and my grandmother and my great grandmother and everybody on the line canned. And it is something that I do on occasion. I'm not good at it. It's not my favorite thing. And it's very time consuming. It gets very hot in the house. 
uh, you know, you have to boil jars and then you have to boil the fruit and you put it in the jars and you boil the jars again. So there's boiling water at the most, you know, inappropriate time in the year when it's hot in the house anyway, and you're running your air conditioning just to stay ahead and then you're boiling everything. And I had gotten some peaches, stopped at a roadside stand that had, uh, there was a gentleman, uh, uh, I can say it nicely because he was very elderly gentleman and I was talking about the fact that I was going to be canning peaches for the next week and he said to me why on earth are you canning peaches because <laughs> I I want organic peaches for the winter and I don't want to pay three dollars for a, a can of organic peaches and when you can't get them any other time and he said this is what all you have to do you take the peach and you wash the peach and dry it thoroughly. It might have to sit for 24 hours. And then you take a bunch of peaches and you stick them in a freezer bag and you make sure that it's a freezer bag that is BPA free, right? And you slide it shut and you put them so that they're not touching each other into the freezer and that's all you have to do. And I said, no, I'm pretty sure you have to do other things. Like, don't you have to pit them? Don't you have to take the peels off of them? All these other things that I've always thought you had to do. And he said, no, because when you take them out one peach at a time and you run them under hot water, the skin will just fall off. And then you have the choice of, you know, what would you like to now do with this peach? Do you want to cook this peach? You know, how do you want to eat this peach? You could eat it frozen and it's like a peach ice cream kind of thing. You know, obviously you have to be aware of the pit, but, um, you know, many different things that you can do with this peach, or you can thaw it in the microwave, thaw it on the counter, slice it up, do whatever you want with it. It sounded all too easy with me, but I had to go home and try it while I was canning peaches. And I spent an entire weekend canning peaches, but I took like 16 of the peaches and did what he said to do. And I will never can another peach again as long as I live. Because it was so much easier. It was a way that and I, I suddenly remembered that my mother used to also freeze things like raspberries and strawberries. Um, and it was a matter of cleaning them thoroughly, laying them out, making sure that they get completely dried. Um, with things like the raspberries and the strawberries, you may want to free, flash freeze them on uh, a, like a piece of parchment paper on a cookie sheet in your freezer. Just lay them out individually. Once they are frozen enough that they're not going to meld into each other, you you can take them and put them into another bag or you can just rinse them all, put them in a baggie and know that it's going to turn into a raspberry or strawberry brick um, that you'll need to thaw the whole thing at one time. But it is a great way to take advantage of, now that's for, for the fruits, for the vegetables, you do need to at least what they call blanch them. You need to cook them uh, ever so slightly. You don't have to boil the hay nani nani out of them, but you cook them for just a couple of minutes in maybe a minute or two in boiling water and then let it dry thoroughly and then you can freeze them. They make a, um, they have freezer bags that are individual serving bags that you can put meat or vegetables in so that you can pack a serving's worth into a bag and then put 10 bags into a heavy freezer bag um, so that you can reach in, take one, and they don't freeze to each other. It is a way of saving money while eating healthy throughout the winter. You will be amazed at how fresh things taste when you defrost them after, because if you freeze fresh, fresh produce and then thought it is delicious, it still retains most of its nutrients. And as I said, it will be organic and it will taste great and save you money. Something to consider preserving the harvest. We'll be right back after these messages. Skills is an online program that provides assessment, curriculum, positive behavior support planning for challenging behavior, and progress tracking, and it does this all in one place. The Skills Assessment and Curriculum addresses eight areas of development, which even includes advanced higher level areas such as executive functions and cognition, which pretty much makes Skills the only ABA-based set of curricula for teaching more complex skills, things like problem solving, planning, self-management, perspective taking, and even inferring and predicting others' private events. Skills is a four-step system. 
Step one is to add the child to your account. Step two is to start assessment. The skills assessment is the only ABA-based assessment with psychometric research demonstrating the language subscale to have excellent reliability. Every area of human functioning and typical child development from infancy to adolescence was researched, making the skills assessment the most comprehensive of its kind in the world, and we're quite proud of that. Skills is easy to use. Simply click Start Assessment and begin answering questions. Or simply type in a keyword, find specific activities to assess, and add activities to treatment. Step 3. Choose Activities. Once you've completed the assessment, Skills selects from a pool of 4,000 activities categorized by age, level, and skill type to provide you with exactly those activities each child needs. Start by choosing a curriculum, then a lesson, and finally an activity. Click the information icon to view prerequisites, ages in which targets develop, examples, and IEP goals. Click the video icon to watch a short video. Once you've identified an activity you want to teach, adding activities to treatment is a snap. Step 4. Start treatment. Here you can access customizable activity lesson details, add your own customized targets and exemplars, and edit an activity status such as introducing or mastering it. You can even print handouts such as worksheets, tracking forms, visual aids, and other materials. Skills also offers multiple progress charts, mapping curriculum progress, lesson progress, and cumulative number of activities and targets mastered over time. The Skills Language Curriculum is categorized by verbal behavior type so that users can identify progress for verbal operants, such as echoics, mans, tax, and interverbals. Skills is one of the only programs that provides the ability to write behavior intervention plans, or BIPs, for challenging behavior. With just a few clicks, the outline of the behavior intervention plan is written for you and ready to be printed and implemented. You can learn more about Skills today and get started by visiting us at www.skillsforautism.com or you can call us at 877-975-4559. Skills. Progress starts here. Welcome back to Autism Live. I mentioned we had a good job of writing in your questions, and it's part of my mission this week that we are going to answer all of the questions. Uh, so I want to start with, obviously, we have different experts that come in, and there are questions that I want to save for the experts, but there are some that I can take and refer you to a video that we've done before. So somebody wrote in over the weekend about toilet training. We have done several different videos about toilet training, so I'm going to ask you to go to our YouTube page, type in the keyword toilet training. You'll be able to see Dr. Dorian Grampache talking about it, uh, Dr. Amy Kenzer. I know we have done shows with uh, BCBA, uh, Angela Persicky about this. I'm, I would bet that every expert we've had on has talked about this in some respect. They all will reference Fox and Azrin, which is a study that was done on, uh, it's a method of toilet training. I'm going to break down uh, and talk about the question a little bit that somebody wrote in. I need help on toilet training. My three and a half year old boy isn't afraid of the toilet, though doesn't request. I need to time it. And when he sits too long, he begins to scratch to the point of bleeding. Okay. So some of the things that we need to talk about with toilet training, and again, I urge you to go and watch the, the videos uh, by the experts. But as a parent who has been through the training, I'll try to highlight some of the, the more important aspects of it. But remember, every child is different, right? And it's key that you start in the right place. If your child is willing to go to the bathroom and the bathroom is not a frightening place, you can miss this first step. But if they are afraid of the bathroom or they're not interested in going to the bathroom, they don't find it rewarding, one of the first things that we might consider doing is making the bathroom a happy, happy place. Um, you know, one of the things that you're going to have to do at some point is what they call, you're going to take data. <laughs> you're going to take a baseline of when your child's going to the bathroom and what they're doing. There are all kinds of charts online. Uh, Skills has them, but you can find them online. Just put in toilet training schedule, uh, or you can make your own grid, right? But you want to write down every, and like hang the clipboard in the bathroom so you don't forget it, right? And get yourself a timer. You're going to set yourself up for success by getting these two things. And when you're in this phase, phase of taking the baseline, you really don't have to be doing anything else, but you could 
could at the same time be teaching your child that the bathroom is a really reinforcing place. Um, so you've got your sheet and you're, you're taking notes on when your child goes to the bathroom. You're not talking to them about it, but you know, you're sitting there with your child and you're doing something and you see them straining, they're going to the bathroom. No need to mention about it, but you write it down in the thing. Okay, you know, it's 3.15 in the afternoon and he had a bowel movement. And you can also take notes on, you know, was it a runny bowel movement? I know, isn't this a lovely morning conversation? But, you know, uh, you can note and say uh, it, it, what consistency it was. You can also, uh, when you're doing this, start to note, give your child a drink drink, right? First thing in the morning, we usually give them something to drink when we give them breakfast or even before breakfast. Um, and, and note, okay, they got, they woke up and the diaper was wet. So you don't know what, at what point that happened. Um, and then you give them something to drink and time, sometimes it's difficult because you can't always tell when they're peeing, but start to get really diligent about noticing. So I gave him a drink at 8.15 and at 8.35, he wet the diaper. Okay. Okay, and there's no mention of it to the child. So you start to, over a period of time, you'll notice, like let's say you do this for four days, you'll notice, okay, if I give my child a drink, that approximately 18 minutes later my child pees. Okay, now we got a window to work with, right? Uh, and in the meantime, we've made that bathroom an exciting place. One of the things that we did was we uh, got our timer and we had one of those, first we had one of the old fashioned timers that made you turn it and it makes the tick, 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 drove me crazy. But it would make a ding. Uh, <laughs> And whenever we, we would be doing whatever in the house and we would set the timer and while we were doing the baseline, it had nothing to do with the potty training, nothing to do with the chart, right? But we would set it and when it would go ding, we would go, yay! Everybody in the house, whether it was my husband, my mother, the therapist, whoever was in the house, when the timer would go ding, we'd go, yay! And we'd go, we're going to the potty, we're going to the potty. And we'd do our little line conga dance into the bathroom, we'd get into the bathroom, we'd shut the door and we'd go, yay! we're in the bathroom and that's all we do we would never set him on the, the toilet seat it was just we're going to the bathroom and he loved it now do all children love this no you might have to find something else but we made it a party that when that thing would go off it was party happening here party central um, so in that respect my son wasn't afraid to go in the bathroom so about a week later after we'd done this and we had our data and went oh okay we know that you know he pees 15 minutes exactly after eating he's pretty much consistent that's how long it takes his body to process I had no idea that our bodies are timed out and that everybody has a different time you drink and then you need to be you know a certain number of, I had no idea but it's true so uh, useless information that we gain on this journey right <laughs> but so now we've got a we've got an idea of what our window for success is. So you clear your schedule for a couple of days. Your child already loves going into the bathroom. It's exciting. And by the way, you can put stuff in the bathroom to make it exciting. You put the potty book that they love. You put the stuffed animal in the bathroom. Whatever you have to do to make that bathroom, woohoo! the place that there's a party play music have a video player in there. Whatever you need to do, make it a happy place, right? Now we know, uh, and we're going to get the child up in the morning and we're going to clear the schedule from everything else and we're not going to focus on teaching 35 other things. We're, we're going to not plan on flying across the country for this weekend that we're going to target the toilet training. And what we're going to do is say to ourselves, okay, if I know that this child uh, goes to the bathroom every 12 minutes after drinking, and by the way, we're starting with the potty training, not the poop training, um, usually with most kids. So if we know that it's 12 minutes, then I need to give a couple of minutes in either direction. So I'm going to make sure that the child drinks a bunch of water and I might have to feed him a bunch of salty things to get him to drink as much water because I'm setting him up for success, he or she. Um, and then I set the, I give them the salty things, I give them the drink and I set my timer. By the way, eventually we went to a digital timer, it went beep, 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 beep. It was still great, right? I set the timer. And and I say, I know that, you know, he pees after 12 minutes, so I'm going to set it for 10 minutes. I'm not going to count on myself to remember in 10 minutes because that's the way we fall apart. I set the timer and I set it down and we go about our lives and I don't have to think about it. And the timer goes beep, 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 beep. And the party starts. We go, yay! 
yay, it's time to go to the potty. It's time to go to the potty, right? Only now we get into the potty and I bring the timer with me and we make sure that it's still reinforced and we go, yay. We're going to sit on the potty, whatever the potty is. And hopefully they've seen mom and dad and whoever sitting on the potty and going, yay, right? So we take and we make a big deal about, yay, what a big girl, what a big boy. And we put them on the potty and we don't walk away. We stay there with them and we take the timer and we set it for five minutes. We don't want it to be longer than five minutes because that's when it starts to be painful for a child. And by the way, if you can't get your child to sit on the potty for five minutes, do two minutes, right? Um, but five, you don't want it to be more than five minutes. So you've set the timer for five minutes and you're in the bathroom and it's, you know, you're, and you're taking the child's mind off of things. You're dancing, you're reading the book, you're doing whatever. And if during that five minutes they pee in the potty, it, it is in mayhem, <laughs> whatever is exciting to the child, you deliver it. Uh, if that child's favorite thing is ice cream, you know, it's ice cream, it's yay, it's fabulous, I'm so proud of you, what a big boy, what a big girl you are, woohoo! And you immediately get them off the toilet, you help them to get everything all taken care of and say, let's, you know, but give them something fun and take them to do something fun, make it so that they want to do it again, right? Um, yay! everything is wonderful if they don't pee within the given time that's okay we just don't turn on the lights for the party we don't we don't say oh you were supposed to pee you know we, we kind of want it to just be something that happens naturally and then we just reward it so there's no big discussion about it and so you take the child off the potty and you go come on let's go play right kind of a neutral reaction nothing bad happened there's no well you were supposed to do this no it's just okay time time's up we go back in right um and but you take the timer and you set it for and this is where it gets tricky because you're now going to start to see you might set it for five minutes the first time that you go and you play for five minutes it goes ding party again yay we're going to the party and you keep setting it for whatever time you decide until you either have an accident or that you have a success you are going to have accidents. When the accidents happen, it's a non-reaction. There is no recrimination. There's no, you know, you were supposed to do that in the potty. We just, it's like nothing happened. We change the child. We're not get, hugging them and saying it's okay, but we're also not, not speaking to them or ignoring them or whatever. We change the things and we get rid of the soiled things. We don't shame them about it. We put the new stuff on and we, we go back, feed the salty snack, give the, the liquid and set the timer. And we do it again and again and again until usually it takes children a certain number of times where you happen to hit it in the window. You are going to have accidents, um, but you don't go back to diapers. You make sure that they feel the wetness. This is why you clear your schedule for the weekend. But most individuals that you set yourself up for success this way, usually within two to four days, it's worth, if you've made it exciting enough for them, they get the potty training. So important though, um, that you don't leave them on the potty for too long. We're not putting them on the potty and waiting for the success. We're putting them on for that brief window of time because it does start to hurt. They have to balance uh, and a child could begin to be doing other things. So I think that that's, watch the videos, hear the experts explain it, but that's how we get the potty under control. And then just recently we had Dr. Grandpa Shea talk about how do you get the poop thing under control and having big reinforcement for the child for doing the poop thing is is I that's what worked for us we had the little Lego knight that sat on the to uh, the towel bar and he knew that if as soon as he had a bowel movement every day he got to play with the knight for the rest of the day and we tried other things but that was the thing that was reinforcing enough for him to be able to monitor what his body was doing and to keep track of it it all comes down to making sure that they get reinforced for the behavior that we want them to do and you have to be willing and if you think for a second that you can do it without a timer i just want to lovingly tell you you can't 
you can't. I carried a timer around with me, and even when after the first couple of days when he had the potty training, the, the timer went with me, and can I tell you, uh, we would be like, in the car or I would be in the checkout stand and the timer would go off and I would think, oh no, what has my life come to? And we would, I abandoned things in line at Target and said, I'm sorry, we have to go to the bathroom. But you know what? Doing that for about a month, that's all it took. And my child didn't have accidents anymore. Um, we have to commit to this period of time in our lives and it's really not comfortable but it's a lot less comfortable than having to go buy diapers for a child that is well beyond the age where diapers are socially acceptable. You can do this. You might need some help calling the reinforcements and definitely watch the, all of the videos that we've done on toilet training. But um, I would, I would make sure you're not leaving the child on too long. All right, we are going to take a break and go to the A word. Then we're going to come back and answer some more questions. So if you have questions, now's a good time to be sending them in. First, though, this is the A word, an ongoing documentary in which they're following a little boy who was diagnosed with autism, and you can watch him being toilet trained uh, in this series. That's not the episode we're watching today. But let's take a look and see what Jack Riley is up to this week. This is the A word. I know a cute little blue eyed boy, and his name is Jack. Jack Riley! He got a big, warm, blue eyed soul that makes your heart beat fast. Yes, I sing Jack, Jack, Jack is my buddy. Jack, Jack, Jack Woo! is my buddy. Everybody around is so down with Jack. Jack! <laughs> Her again. Jack Riley, come back and walk nicely to her. Walk nicely. Oh, yeah, high fives! Yay! You did it! She's so happy! So, you guys are doing more programs trying to incorporate sister? Yes, trying to have them tolerate being around her and um, practicing having them engage in the same activity. From his target right now is two minutes, so we're hopefully trying to increase the time. But she's going to be around forever, so. We do want him to get used to being around her and accepting that she will get into his stuff every now and then, or all the time. <laughs> We're gonna do um, nice playing with Lainey, okay? We're gonna do it five times, all right? All right, so you put on a piece and then Lainey Grace can put one on. Yay, look, you get your first X. Good job, buddy. We're gonna keep going. That was excellent. Okay, Lainey's turn. Here you go. Good job. I okay, Lainey. Okay. I'll help your sister. Yay. Yes, a potato head. Wait, your turn. Good job. Should we put the ear on, Lainey? purpose of outings uh, that we go on with our kids is to have them get exposure to the community, and we go with them to assist the parents and to model for them how to redirect inappropriate behaviors when they do happen, how to even prompt the kids to interact with other kids. So when they do go out and we're not there, it's a lot easier for them, and it just becomes more natural for the parents okay. and the kids. Usually I'm pretty on edge at a park when he walks up to a group. I never know what he's going to do. Sometimes it's imagined, and then sometimes he justifies it. <laughs> That was the A word, uh, a really great episode talking about both sibling issues and outings. The overriding thing for me is that we all need to remember how important it is to have opportunities to work on something. Um, you know, when so often when something happens, even you or I, if we're trying to do a new skill and something happens and we go, oh, I didn't get it right, we don't always have the opportunity to say, hey, let's back it up and let me try it again and let me try it again. But in reality, that is the way we learn things. It's the way all of us learn things, by backing up, having another opportunity to try it. 
Dr. Tarbox, uh, who comes in with, and talks with us about things from a research perspective on Fridays, always talks about we know what works is giving somebody more opportunities and giving them immediate feedback, giving them that reinforcement, that that's really the most effective teaching strategy for absolutely anything. That's what an Olympic athlete does, right? And it's what we do with our kids when we're being the most effective and most efficient. So you saw that moment when he ran over and just knocked into his sister. And if any of you are out there who have multiple children, you know that that's going to happen, right? Um, but instead of letting it go and giving him a lecture about it, the therapist says, hey, you know, let's try that again. And let's have you come up and, uh, you know, walk past your sister without doing that. And so he does. And she goes, yay. Now she could have given him a big lecture about it, right? Which we've all done. I myself am guilty of that. Um, but it doesn't work, right? <laughs> and we do that to hear ourselves talk, I think, sometimes. Um, but this is what works. And then you see that she sets up a circumstance for him and says, hey, we're going to play nicely with your sister five times. And she writes it down on the chalkboard. Now, you may notice she's got a timer because sometimes, probably in the beginning, they would say, okay, you're going to do, uh, you know, you're going to walk up and do this nicely with your sister. Okay, that's one try of something. But when we're just playing nicely together, sometimes it's hard to figure out, well, you know, uh, well, when are we rewarding? And so she's got a timer that's set there. Another reason why you want to have a timer, we call this a timed interval for something. So if he plays nicely within that interval, now in the beginning, it might be that that timed interval is 30 seconds. And then it works up to being 10 minutes per interval. Okay, we're going to do this five times. That's 50 minutes. That wouldn't be realistic for children this age. But eventually, we want for, you see him going on outings because eventually we want him to be able to have a play date with another child and absolutely go 50 minutes with no strife. And we can work up to that if we go very slowly. So giving them the opportunity, setting up the circumstances, uh, we can do this with younger children. We can do this with older children. I was saying that it was just, uh, it's been probably well over a year and a half now, but we, my son and I were walking out of a store and I don't even remember what it was he did, but it wasn't working for me. And I said, hey, let's go back and leave the store again and let's try it again. He looked at me like I'd lost my mind, but you know what? <laughs> and he was a little embarrassed, but whatever it was that he was doing, he hasn't done since. So giving them the opportunity to fix something in the moment uh, can be a great gift that we can give all of our children and ourselves, uh, but always giving opportunities to learn whenever we're teaching something absolutely key. Now the A word, you can be watching this entire series. I mentioned you could watch where he's being toilet trained. You can go to their own YouTube page and put in search terms and find the episode that you want or watch it from beginning to end. It's all educational, uh, whether it's what the parents are going through emotionally. I mean, dad just talking about when I see him approach a group of kids at the playground, I'm filled with fear and trepidation. And sometimes it's justified and sometimes it's not. Um, you know, I think we can all relate to that. But check it out, the A word. It's there for a reference for you, a very hopeful reference. We're going to take a break and we're going to come back and answer a parent's question that came in over the weekend about being able to go to their child's school and see what's happening. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Bryce Myler and I'm the Contracts Director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I've been here for about five years. CARD has several employees with many years of insurance experience uh, dealing with insurance, dealing with pre-authorizations, dealing with discovering whether there's coverage or not. So we have more experience than any ABA provider that I've ever come across. So for, for a prospective client, somebody that may be interested in you know ABA therapy and what CARD has to offer, we have a special 800 number um, and you call that number. They will talk to you about what we have to offer, uh, how ABA works. He'll ask you for the front and back of your ID card and then we check to see if you do or do not have coverage. If you have coverage for ABA therapy, we try to do whatever we can to set it up where we can bill for you and you don't have to fight with the insurance company every month to get your claims paid. For California residents, we recently did a series of insurance trainings all over the state and you can click on the link below 
to watch pretty much the full presentation. It has a lot of information how you can get your insurance company to, to comply with what they're supposed to do, uh, understanding the networks and many other um, valuable pieces of information. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're making a real effort this week to get caught up in the questions that you guys have written us because we love when you guys write in and ask us questions. Uh, I've mentioned that some of the questions I'm saving until we have different experts like tomorrow with Dr. Doreen Grampache. Um, we have different BCBAs throughout the week and I'm just gonna be taking the ones that deal with things that I think are parent related. Uh, the next one, uh, my son was diagnosed as autistic in 2011. The school district we're in pressured me into letting my three-year-old son go to school. There are various reasons why I'm not pleased with the school system, ranging from disrespect to just wrongdoing. I'll take that up with the superintendent this week, but can a school district really not allow a parent to see what their child is doing? I don't necessarily mean going into the class, but at least looking through the door of the classroom. Um, and they write that they are in Louisiana. A parent just can't show up. We have to make an appointment with the principal and be escorted by her for 15 minutes with a 24 hour notice. And that's only if she isn't busy. My son just turned three in November of 2012 and they expected for me just to drop him off with these restrictions. I've never been so stressed in my life. I wasn't going to let him go back there this year, but they threatened that when he was ready to start regular regular pre-K, he'd be in a regular class. Are these threats and restrictions lawful? At first I read awful, because yes, they are awful, but yes, some of them are lawful. So let's take it from the top. Um, so I'm thrilled for you that you are so on it and that you've gotten the diagnosis and um, you're already looking at what do you want to do. And yes, I'm sure that the school district did pressure you to let the three-year-old go to school. The, the school district, and please let me say as a disclaimer, as I start here, I am an ex-public school teacher and I also taught college. Um, and so I always like to remind all of us that there are really good people who are working in the public school system who have devoted their lives to helping our kids. And I mean our kids, not just all kids. There are people there that are educated and there are people there. We had the teacher of the year here talking about autism. There are good people in the school system, but there are also people who don't get it, aren't educated, aren't interested in being educated about autism, and a lot of them work in administration. I don't know how that works out, but it does. We have to be mindful as parents that there are, there are people who don't know what they're talking about, and there are also people who are tasked with with making, they have to be, you have to understand this, it's not that they're bad people, but they have been tasked with making the dollar amount equal the dollar amount that they have. That is their job, that is what they need to do on a daily basis, and that is not necessarily what's best for your child. So they are going to try to save money and do what they can where they can. We have to be mindful as parents that their agenda is not our agenda. Right? I have a friend who says, show me the dollar sign that's floating over my child's head and when you can show it to me and point it to me, then I'll listen to you about the dollar sign. We have a job to advocate for our children, but yes, they will advocate for what is best financially for them. Um, and important to recognize what the differences between those two are. I hear you when you say that you're unhappy about the school district from ranging from disrespect to just plain wrongdoing. And obviously neither of those is acceptable, but they are vastly, vastly different. Um, people can be disrespectful without meaning to be, but when somebody does something wrong, we have to be very mindful of that because that is a huge warning flag. And I appreciate that you're going to take it up with the superintendent this week. Um, okay, but let's get to the, the meat of the question here. Can a school district really allow a parent not to see what their child is doing? Yes. Within a, uh, a school district, they will have rules that they will set up for various and sundry reasons about who's allowed to come on campus and when. And especially in this environment of bad things happening on campus, I'm hearing more and more and experiencing more and more that schools are really cracking down on who's allowed to come, how much time they're allowed to spend, and who they're allowed to bring with them. It is not unusual 
for a school to set an amount of time and say this is how much notice you must have. Now, there are ways around it, right? Um, and one of the ways that a lot of our parents and myself included have found around it is to volunteer. And um, that's one of the quickest ways that you get a beat on what's happening in the school, how you get people to help you more and get more access. Even within a school district, each teacher has different environments. I have worked in and had my child in school districts that have rules about, oh, you can come 20 minutes and you can observe, but you have to have a, an escort and you have to give 24 hours notice. I think in some cases it's longer than 48 hours notice. And yes, they have to be available and they have to approve it and they have the right to say no and have to reschedule. Um, but there are teachers who will say, I don't participate in that. My door is open. You may come in whenever you want. Want. I personally think that that is a good way. There are parents who will abuse that and come in and stay all day when it isn't necessary or good for their child or anybody else's child. So, you know, there it's a tough, tough decision about what's best in terms of education. If if education is really happening, having parents there on a regular basis and having experts come into view on a regular basis isn't going to be the best thing for education. But I'm with you that I will not carte blanche just go, oh, here is my child. I hope that you're somebody who's on the up and up. Um, it is stressful for us and there are many cases, documented cases of children who get hurt because they're put in classrooms with people who don't know what they're doing. So you are entitled to your feelings and you are entitled to take action about what to do about it. I would encourage you um, a couple of different things. Um, let's continue on reading though uh, with the questions here. Um, they're expecting for you to drop them off with the restrict restrictions um, and that they're threatening you that if he doesn't go to school this year that uh, and start regular pre-k he'd be in a regular class. When he was ready to start regular pre-k he'd be in a regular class. They cannot really threaten you with what your child's placement will be in a year or two years based on what you choose to do right now. That they can't do. They can try, but they can't do that. Lots can happen in the next two years and they can't decide the child's placement that far in advance. Um, and what I would encourage you to do from this moment on, first thing is to document everything document everything. Just get Johnny on it. If you have a conversation with the superintendent this week uh, and you leave the office, immediately upon leaving the office, write an email to him or her and say, you know, Dr. So-and-so, it was so lovely meeting to you today. In reference to when you said blah, 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 and I said blah, 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 I just want to make sure that you know that I'm clear that la, 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 la right? And you send that off because, and, uh, and if you want to, uh, make sure that you include something in it that asks a question that he or she has to respond back or send a return receipt on an email. If your email provider allows you to do that, because you want a record of the fact that they read the email. Um, because it will be helpful if you have to lawyer up and you may have to. They are going, at this point, they're probably taking your temperature to see how big of a pain in the neck are you going to be? Because if you're gonna be a pain in the neck, then they're going to um, judge whether or not you're somebody who is gonna cost them more money legally uh, and then they're just going to give you what you want or they're going to take you to court if they think that they can win. But if you've kept good records, it will make it more likely that you don't have to go to court, right? And who wants to go to court? It's expensive and time consuming and you have better things to do with your time than to be arguing with them. So I would just start keeping a legal record of everything. There was at least one time when uh, I said to a school official on the record, I said, uh, you know, if we need to take this to uh, due process, we can. I think you should know that I've kept documentation of everything. Uh, and then suddenly everything got easier. You want to be as nice as you possibly can, but as firm as you possibly can so that they see that you mean business and that you're going to do what you want to do. If your gut is saying to you that this placement for your three and a half year old um, is not what's right, 
I am a huge fan of not having children in preschool until they are ready. Notice I said preschool, not school. Um, in for those early years before a child turns five, we know that unless their program is intensive, one-on-one -on -one ABA, there's a better placement for your child. Um, and if you go and do that now, it may be that when your child goes to kindergarten, there might be no discussion. Your child will just go to a regular day class and be fine and happy and healthy and you won't have to have IEPs. So I would encourage you to at least consider whether that's a possibility. You wrote that you're in Louisiana and I don't know, I'll have to look at a map to see the place that you said in Louisiana, how close you are to Baton Rouge. Um, I know that the Center for Autism and Related Disorders just opened their Baton Rouge office and it's a center-based system where your three and a half year old could go there you would be welcome all the time he would have the same ability to interact with other children that he would get in a pre-k but he would be getting one-on-one -on -one aba uh, i know that you've got insurance reform there and so it's very possible that you are covered and that that would cost you nothing or a copay um so if you're close enough to Baton Rouge, I would ask you to consider that and step back from this argument with these people who are trying to pressure you into doing things that you don't think that are appropriate for your child. Um, but again, if you're going to stick with the school, I would get everything in writing and make a record of everything in writing. If you have a conversation, you write out the details of the conversation and send it off to them. If they do not write back and say, that is not what I said, you know, it becomes the record of what happened. So uh, do that. I would encourage you to volunteer and just, you know, go to the teacher and say, hey, I want to volunteer. What time can I come in? And if they say that they're not taking volunteers, I would immediately have a big red flag. Immediate big red flag. Every teacher wants volunteers. Every teacher does. So uh, that would be a big concern to me. See if you can volunteer. And then every time you have an actual meeting that you schedule a time, I would be asking if you can bring a tape recorder. I would. Um, and you know, I know sometimes that ruffles people's feathers. Look, these people are already being a pain in the neck about doing what's right. We have, from time to time, we've had Dr. Mike Dorsey on. Dr. Mike Dorsey is the head of the Behavioral Studies Program at Endicott College, and he is considered the leading expert in the United States on placement for a child in a school situation. And one of the pieces of advice he gave us is when you're having difficulties with the school district, one of the first salvos that you want to throw out is, could you please send me a schedule of what my child is doing uh, during the day broken down into 15 or 20 minute increments and which IEP goal is being addressed during that time, that separates, as they say, it's very sexist, but the men from the boys, because the school who can send that back to you within a 24 hour period means that they're actually doing it. And the school that can't, it's going to make them shake in their shoes a little bit because that's what they're supposed to be doing. The day should be segmented into this is what we're working on at this time. And a lot of people just don't. Um, and they shouldn't be allowed to get away with it. Um, other people in other jobs, jobs aren't allowed to do, uh, be uninformed and do a bad job. So we don't let our kids do that. So I hope that answers in terms of what's lawful and what isn't lawful. Yeah, they can absolutely tell you you can only come in and observe this amount of time, whatever it is at their discretion, but they cannot decide your child's placement a year or two in advance based on what you do right now. That's a big, fat, hairy no. And, you know, I wouldn't even listen to that. I wouldn't justify it and say to them, you know, hey, you can't say that to me. I would just go, you know, whatever. <laughs> uh, you know, it's that thing. It's the bully on the playground. It's exactly what we teach our children that, you know, you don't invest a whole lot of energy in getting into the argument with them, but you just go, whatever. Uh, not bothering me when you say stuff like that, right? Uh, and let them know that you're impervious to that. So I hope that's helpful. Write back if you want more information, but uh, I'm going to look and see how close 
he writes that you're in Zachary, and I'm going to see how close that is to Baton Rouge. I would encourage you to go to centerforautism.com, hit the locations tab, uh, call the Baton Rouge office, see if you're close enough to get services there. We're going to take a break, and we're going to come back and get some more of these questions, so stick with us. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides courses in applied behavior analysis for the treatment of autism. Access IBTE learning videos on the move and learn at your own pace. I'm going to talk a little bit about intensity. IBTE learning makes any location your classroom on the go. So our objectives for today are to really learn what is autism and how is it diagnosed. Get professional guidance with IBT face-to-face -face training. IBT face-to-face -face training courses prepare you to effectively implement ABA-based interventions. Choose between small group and one-to-one -one instruction. Earn BCBA supervision hours via one-to-one -one video conferencing. So I had a chance to review your BIP today. You know what? It looked really good. You did a good job with that. IBT continuing education courses. Earn credit through webinars, conferences, article reviews, and e-learning videos. You can learn more at ibehavioraltraining.com. IBT 360 degrees of ABA training. Welcome back to Autism Live. We are getting through some of the questions that you guys have sent in, especially over the weekend. Uh, this next one, the parent writes in and says, there still seems to be many people unaware of autism and the spectrum of the disorder. There have been some serious issues uh, evolving from a lack of empathy and understanding for my family that resulted in mistreatment and hostility. For instance, we have been forced out of a community because our daughter was a bird burden and caused an inconvenience in the church, in the school, etc. I have even had child protective services called on me because I was accused of bad parenting because my child was unable to speak and write. <clears throat> Excuse me. Teachers would ask me, how can I make her write or speak? Why isn't she potty trained yet? The list goes on or would constantly compare my child to a child with Asperger's. My child was diagnosed with classic autism on the severe end of the spectrum. My question is, what can parents do to inform communities? Does any existing, do any existing organizations provide training and tools for parents to combat their community's unawareness and misconceptions about autism? Okay, great question. First of all, I want to say to you that I'm sorry that that is happening to you and it is not your imagination. This is pervasive throughout our world. And just when I think that we have gotten to a place where people get it, I am slapped about the face and reminded that it there is there are so many misconceptions about autism and they run on s at such a level that it's disconcerting it is not honestly it is not until somebody is affected by this very directly that they will take the time to actually learn i you know I mean, there are parents who struggle with another parent who is not willing to take the time, and, and it's pretty direct there, too. There We hear constantly about aunts and uncles and cousins and grandparents who don't take the time to learn and get educated. I will be honest with you and say to you that I had a very good friend whose child was diagnosed with autism, and yet that did not motivate me to learn more about autism and how I could be helpful to her. I really naively looked to her and thought that she would educate me about what she needed. I had no perspective taking about the fact that she did not have the time to do that. I just didn't. Um, and I feel bad about that pretty much on a daily basis and I've apologized to her profusely because boy, uh, when it was my turn and my child was diagnosed, I got a crash course in what she must have gone through in those early days and all the years that I waited for her in her spare time to educate me. I will tell you that there are lots of organizations that are working on this. There's a little thing called Autism Speaks that this is one of their big 
things in life is to let communities know and to have events that get all of us out of our homes and get us out onto the streets and talking about autism and calling attention to it. That is a huge function of what Autism Speaks do. And if you go to their website and go to their resources tab, they have many different things, including the 100 day kit, which helps you to, and there's many different types of 100 day kits now, uh, depending on what your circumstances are. If you've just been, it's for the, your first 100 days after diagnosis, and there's one for if you have a child who's very young and one who's a teenager, uh, you know, one for if uh, English is not your first language, they have them in different languages. So you could check out on Autism Speaks and look on their resources tab and see, and they will also, if you put in your state, you can look under resources for your state and even put in a zip code to see what's close to you in terms of support groups. I think it's helpful and essential to have someone else in your corner who gets it. It allows us to be patient with people that we don't want to be patient with. Even close friends of mine have said things that were just so unspeakable to say to an autism parent and you want to be able to have friends when it's over and you want to be able to recognize okay that was just sheer and complete ignorance so you need to have other parents that you can call up and say you'll never guess what somebody said to me today and I know it's that they just don't know any better but I need to deal with my emotions about what they said first before I can educate them differently really um, quite honestly so autism speaks and find support groups that way but the other organization that I'm really going to call your attention to two of them actually autism society uh, and there's autism society of and fill in the blank there might even be an autism society of the town in which you live there's an autism society of Los Angeles uh, and uh, lots of individual places there's autism society of New York right so uh, see if there's a group there and they work on providing help and information and services and do community outreach as well and then another organization that's just parents um is TACA, Talk About Curing Autism. Uh, we have Lisa Ackerman on the show on a fairly regular basis. She hosts the cooking segment that we do, What's Left. And Lisa started that organization because her child was diagnosed and she said, I don't know what I'm doing and there's gotta be more going on and why does nobody understand this? And so she had a meeting in her living room. And so many people came to that meeting that they started an organization that is now the biggest parent organization in the United States talking about autism and what you can do. It's a huge, huge resource. So you can see if there's a TACA group near you. And but I would point out that Lisa, if there isn't one, Lisa started that group because there wasn't something for her and she felt like she'd lost her community and she needed a community. And you have the ability to do that as well. Um, she put I think she went on Craigslist and left her home address and home phone number and said, you know, if anybody wants to talk about autism, call me. She now says that probably wasn't the best thing to do. But even in my community, we've had Emily Island on before. She did that in our community and, and posted it in a place where other people would see and said, we're going to meet at a coffee shop and we're going to start a group so that people have a support group. I think you need that. I'm so sad that your church, that you've lost your church community because that shouldn't be. And I know that that's not the case with all churches and shame on them for not allowing for your child to be different and unique. That's really particularly disappointing above all the other disappointments, right? Um, but I would tell you that there are other churches that it's part of their ministry to reach out to families with special needs and to be inclusive and they're not just paying lip service to it they're doing it uh, i'll ask nancy allspa jackson to talk about tomorrow that her church does uh, a special outreach a special ministry just for special needs so i would encourage you even though your feelings are probably hurt and you're a little bit uh, bruised and battered from the way your community has behaved to search again maybe find the support group first and see where other people go to church see if you know it's some place that you would feel comfortable bringing your family as for the child services being called this is a tale that we hear all too often that 
parents on the autism spectrum will have child protective services called. Um, sometimes we hear that it's a school district that does that as a way of frightening parents into not asking for services. Uh, other times it's neighbors who misunderstand or well-meaning but misunderstand. I can't imagine anything more frightening than that. I hope that there is a silver lining in it that if Child Protective Services come and you say, I have a child on the autism spectrum, do you have resources for us because, you know, this is what's happening and my child is more profoundly affected. Um, I, you know, see if you can't turn that around. Um, you have nothing to hide. So try not to be afraid, I, and I say try because uh, it's a very scary situation, but you have nothing to hide, you've done nothing wrong. And the other thing that I would like to say is where the teachers are concerned, and the school administrators are concerned, comparing your child to anyone. Uh, as I said to the last parent, write, get it written down. Write an email back and say, as per our conversation, that's like the, set, the beginning sentence of anything you write to the school district anymore. You know, as per our conversation today, when I was talking to you about this and so, and you were comparing my child to another child who has Asperger's, I want to remind you that my child's diagnosis is vastly different than that child's diagnosis. And so we will want to do X, Y, and Z or whatever get it in writing because that is the only way that they're going to stop making comparisons. It is not appropriate for anyone to compare our children to anyone else. That is why they have an IEP. It's an individualized education plan. And you can call that to their attention and say, I want to remind you that my child qualifies for an IEP. And the I stands for individualized, so I will appreciate you in the future not comparing him with someone else who is also on the spectrum. Boom. And get it in writing and CC the superintendent and watch that go away. Um, you know, you have to pick your battles of when you are going to argue with people, when you're going to call it to their attention, and when you're going to let stuff go. Pick and choose your battles. But if things like that keep happening, uh, get it in writing. Okay, uh, we have got some responses to some of the things that we've been talking about. So we're going to take a short break and come back and address those. Stick with us. Hi, I'm Shannon Penrive, and this is my son, Jem. We're here today at the Home Depot. You might know that Home Depot is famous for giving free classes to adults on lots of things like tiling and other home crafts. Well, they also have free classes for kids as well. It's called the Kids Workshop. We love doing that, don't we, Jem? Yeah. It's cool. So come on inside with us, and let's do a craft. Yay. The Kids Workshop is a program that's been around with Home Depot um, almost since we've been a company and it's been developed to allow kids in the community to come in and give them an opportunity to build something, to be able to create something and uh, be able to take just simple wood pieces and put them together with nails and hammers and screwdrivers and then paint them. So you do this every first Saturday of the month. Any Home Depot that you go to on the first Saturday of every month between 9 and 12, you can join uh, different associates throughout different stores and, and build these projects with these kids. And do they have to do anything before? or can they just show up on that Saturday? All they need to do is show up. We, we have all the tools, all the, the materials that the kids will need. We have aprons that we give to the kids that they can take home and uh, maintain their pins. They get pins on a regular basis for completing projects. With that, they can keep track of how many projects they've done. And, uh, and it's all free. It's all absolutely free. All Which provided. is wonderful. And absolutely. Wilson, I have to say, you know, you, you guys devised this for all kids to be able to do this. Correct. What I particularly love about it as an autism mom, it gives my child a place to come and learn a new skill to socialize with kids of all kinds. Absolutely. And that's what we're here for. Home Depot is definitely uh, loves to be involved with the community and bring the community in to work with us. That's what we love to do.
Welcome back to Autism Live. We are looking at the questions that you guys have written in and addressing them as much as we can. I want to be able to get your questions answered this week because we've been a little bit behind. So somebody wrote in and said, hi, I have a son that is three and a half nonverbal and just wanted to know how I tell apart a tantrum from a meltdown and how to appropriately deal with both of them. Okay, a couple of things that I'm going to point out to you. Last week, we did a whole week on tantrums and meltdowns. And in particular, uh, I don't think it's up on YouTube yet, but it will be probably by tomorrow. Dr. Jonathan Tarbox at, uh, in the second hour of the show that was on Friday. So that would have been September 14th. He did a whole long segment on how to prevent meltdowns. So I'm going to ask you to also look at that because he's an expert and he references a lot of things that are research based, tried and true. Um, I, I, but I'm going to take a second as a parent and talk about I think it's different for everybody and everybody has their different litmus test but how I came to think of the difference between a tantrum and a meltdown is a tantrum is when the child it you know they've lost their you know what and they're upset and they're behaving in a way that's challenging right um, the behavior is not good and it's not productive right uh, and tantrums look lots of different ways. But you know how sometimes it's like a little invisible line has been crossed and the child is upset and they're reacting in a certain way, but you have that sense that if you gave them the thing that they want, the tantrum would end right? But then a meltdown is such that they, it's gone over the top. And even it, let's say that the child is tantruming because they want a lollipop, right? And they're carrying on about it. And they're kicking things and they're throwing things and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're, you know, and so upset. And if you were to say, okay, you can have the lollipop. You've seen children do this before where they're crying hysterical and you give them what they want and it's like the waterworks get turned off and immediately they're like, oh, okay. And you go, whoa, what just happened, right? Um, in meltdown, even if you were to give the lollipop, the child would still be upset and, you know, visibly upset and not really consolable. So for me, that's the difference between the two things. And... I don't know that that's particularly scientific, but as a parent, that's how I've come to think of it. And for me, the difference is that with the meltdown, so the uh, uh, meltdown is a tantrum that has some other component to it that has made the child not consolable. And usually that component is something in the environment. It could be that the child didn't get enough sleep. It could be that the child is dehydrated. It could be that the child ate something that they're allergic to. It could be that the child is wearing a uh, a, a piece of clothing that is scratchy. It could be that there is an overhead fluorescent light that the timer on it is just off enough that it's flickering in a way that you and I can't notice it, but the child is uh, being, you know, thrown off from it. Um, you know, any one of a thousand things that sensory wise could be contributing to the child's inability to cope. And that for me is what the meltdown is. Now, uh, either way, if it's the tantrum or the meltdown, there are a couple of things that we want to do and there are a couple of things we don't want to do. Whether it's a tantrum or a meltdown, th we talked earlier about, you know, teaching opportunities. There's always a chance to do something better, right? Not during a tantrum or meltdown. Mm -mm, we're not teaching anything. It's like, you know, school shut, the doors close, we're, we're only dealing with the tantrum and the meltdown. We're not going to take the opportunity to talk to the child about, about how they can behave better or if you had done this, oh, no, 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 no. That's over in that moment in time with some small asterisks, which we'll talk about in a second. Our first priority when a child, if we're already in the tantrum and meltdown, our first priority is to make sure that everybody's safe. Uh, children have the ability to hurt themselves or someone else or property when they are having tantrums or meltdowns. So our first priority in when this kind of behavior is happening is to lock down whatever is going on. Uh, you're going to make it impossible for the child to run out into traffic. You're going to make it impossible for them to break glass and hurt themselves. You're going to make it impossible for them to hurt somebody else. It might be tricky, but you know, my, my husband and I got very good at my son when he would do a tantrum he would do what we called the swipe maneuver and we would have a bunch of stuff on the table because maybe he'd be having therapy or we'd have dinner or whatever and if he was having a tantrum his little arm would go like that and stuff would fly and so when we we got good
good at recognizing and when he would do the thing we would immediately grab everything and put it away or whatever it was I wish we had videotape of my husband and I doing this because we got really good at it and there was nothing to swipe there was just nothing to swipe and there would be you know and sometimes that would incite him to riot just a little bit more because he didn't get his you know release from he liked the way it felt when he made things break um so you lock down the area it may be difficult but you want to keep yourself safe keep your child safe and keep the stuff safe as much as possible um then you know, the next thing to do on your list of things to think through on your checklist is to not give in to whatever caused it. So in the moment, what you want to think to yourself is get into a safe place inside where, where you just start taking notes on what's happening, right? Uh, by the way, this is what they tell victims to do when they're in the middle of being assaulted, to just like mentally shut everything else down and start taking notes like a court reporter. Oh, okay. He's, he's throwing himself on the floor. Yes, he's kicking. He is screaming. What is it that he's saying? Right? I need to make mental note of that because I'm going to write it down on a sheet later on. You just literally start to think like a scientist. You know, on Dragnet, they used to say, just the facts, ma'am. And so you're thinking through what the facts are. Okay, he's screaming. Oh, look at that. He just went up an octave with his voice. All right, now, you know, she's attempting to bite me, but I've blocked that. Okay, because you got to keep, you got to have something going on. So that's what you're going to do is like a court reporter, notice everything that's going on and you don't give into it. So if you know that it started because the child wanted a lollipop, you don't give the lollipop. If you know that the child started the tantrum because they wanted to get out of getting in the bathtub, you still put them in the bathtub. You're keeping everybody safe. Remember that's priority number one, but you don't let them out of the thing that they tried to get out of. Um, and in that way, you're not making the tantrum worse. You're not feeding the tantrum. Um, and you're not making it so that tantrums are going to happen more often. A lot of times it's really difficult to know how much attention to give. Um, but in this moment, we, we're not 100% sure why the tantrum is happening. So you want to be really careful with your attention. We never ignore the child but we do ignore the behavior. What's the difference? Uh, ignoring the child would be going into the other room and acting as if you've never heard or seen from them. Ignoring the behavior would be staying in the room, doing something else and not attending to, uh, if they're yelling, Mah! you don't turn and go, what, right? Um, you wait and sometimes it feels like it's an eternity, but if they're yelling, ma, 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 and then they'll scream that much louder, right? And you're, you know, the example that I always give is me watering the plants. I'm watering the plants and waiting until a reasonable voice comes out. I don't say, you know, I'm waiting with, especially with a small child, right? Um, because they're not going to understand that and it's still attention. But with the first time they say, mom, they turn and go, yes. And they learn, oh, I got to have my voice in that tone before you're going to directly respond to me. But you never are ignoring the child. I'm still very aware of what's happening. I'm just not giving in to the inappropriate request for attention. Uh, same thing with meltdowns. But with meltdowns, you also want to scan the area and see, you know, what is happening. Is my child hot? Is my child cold? Uh you know, does my child need a drink? And if they do, you don't want to be giving the drink in amongst the meltdown, but the first possible opportunity, you want to see if you can minimize those environmental things and take note of, you know, what's happening, what's here in the environment that might be contributing to this so that you can deal with that at a later date. Um, <clears throat> Again, Dr. Tarbox on Friday went through very specific things about how to prevent getting to that moment when the tantrum or the meltdown is happening. And I want to encourage you to watch that because he is a brilliant expert with great expertise in this area. And that should be available either later today or tomorrow on YouTube. But the other, the last bit of advice that I always give about during a tantrum is do not allow yourself to go to a place where you think, what must people think of me? It's really hard, but I always say this on the show, other people's opinions of you are none of your business. Um, they don't know what you're dealing with. They don't know what you're going through. They don't know what your deal is. So why would we look for them to decide whether we're doing a good job? Right? 
<laughs> they don't let Olympic judges judge unless they have some expertise and knowledge in the sport that they're judging. These people do not understand autism. Don't allow them to judge you and give you a score. You just let that go. Um, and, and let go of the idea that this is your fault uh, and that this is going to be the rest of your life because it's not. You are going to get it under control. Um, but again, watch Dr. Tarbox's interview about that. We are going to take a break and come back with more questions. Stick with us. The Institute for Behavioral Training provides programs students and professionals proven techniques using applied behavior analysis. Access online video lessons with IBT eLearning. Get one-on-one -on -one personalized instruction with IBT face-to-face -face training. Acquire professional guidance with IBT BCBA supervision. Develop professional growth with IBT continuing education courses. Get access to IBT services today. IBT 360 degrees of ABA training. Welcome back to Autism Live. We're going through some of the questions that you guys have written, and I'm going to save some of these for Dr. Doreen Grandpache because tomorrow is Ask Dr. Doreen. Dr. Doreen Grandpache will be with us first thing in the morning, and I'm going to save some of these for her. I did want to take a moment to talk about your answers to the question of the day today on Facebook. We asked you today, what's the hard, what transitions are the hardest for your child? Some very interesting responses that you guys wrote in. Somebody said at the moment it's when something breaks or is lost. He can't move on without repairing or locating the item or situation. Um, you know, and that would come under the heading of inflexibility. When uh, kids have to do things in a certain sequence and they can't move on to something else. Now that can be very frustrating and left unchecked, it could lead to them being inflexible about other things as well. You got to be really careful when working with these kinds of things, but we know that we can very slowly and systematically desensitize our children to this idea that things have to be a certain way. And key here is working on things that aren't necessarily, they're inflexible to begin with. So uh, that if we have, a, we set up a rule that, you know, first we brush our teeth and then we put our shoes on, then, and we set that rule up and then we say, okay, today we're going to do it different and we make it very reinforcing. Today we're going to do something really fascinating that we're going to brush our teeth, uh, we're we're going to put our shoes on first and then brush our teeth, right? And teach them that sometimes doing something different is fun so that you can get to the point where it might take six months to a year, but you can get to the point where your child works up to something is broken and we reinforce them so heavily for allowing it to be broken and coming back for it later on. And it may just be that we come back in 10 seconds the first time and the next time we come back in 15 seconds until we get to the point where we can come back a day later. Um, but heavily reinforcing them for letting it be. They will have anxiety and allowing them to work through the anxiety in really manageable por portions to learn that, okay, I can get through this, uh, can be a very exciting skill for children to gain. Somebody else said summer vacation back to school, similarly after long breaks like winter break or spring break. I think that's hard for all of us. I don't think any of us, um, uh, you know, are, are thrilled when it's that hard of a transition. But some of the things you can think of are um, doing a slow ramp up so that even um, though you can't actually go back to school before you go back to school and usually they start back to school and they say, well, you know, it's a six and a half hour day. Um, what you can do is get the child slowly back on the schedule of we get up at this time, this happens at this time, going through the routines of what happens at school and going through the bedtime routine that changes and making sure that you're reinforcing that. Uh, we always have a big deal with Jem that the first day of school we do something exciting because it's yay, we're going back to school. And we always in those first couple of weeks, and teachers do this too, they miss minimize what the demands are on the children. It's why it takes a couple of weeks to get back in the groove when you go back to school. Because uh, we don't want to throw them in the deep end of the pool, right? 
Another person who says outside to inside and leaving a place she loves, which is preschool. Isn't it amazing how different kids are? Some kids can't wait to come home from school. Some kids can't wait to go. Uh, we want to make sure that we help them going from a preferred activity to a non-preferred activity by making it really worthwhile, rewarding that compliance. Uh, just last night, my son was playing a game he hasn't been allowed to play in a long time. And I asked him to come downstairs and I thought, oh, this is going to be murder and I'm going to have to ask him 32 times. And I called upstairs and I said, I need you to come downstairs. And he came down first time with no prompting and I made sure that it was worth his while. Uh, he got huge rewards and even got more time playing his game than he would have gotten afterwards after he did the things that I wanted him to do because I said it was so great that I didn't have to ask you twice. I'm building that up about I ask you to do uh, somebody wrote in and said, happy birthday to my son. They can't believe I have a teenager. I don't, you must be confusing me with somebody else. I had a birthday over the weekend, but my son is still only 10. Please don't rush me. I'm not ready for a teenager yet. <laughs> I have three more years and I'm taking them and I don't want to be rushed. Uh, somebody else said transitions from something fun to something involving work, patience or concentration. I think we all struggle with that, right? We have to make sure that the thing for a period of time, that the, the transition itself gets rewarded. Uh, somebody else says potty training is so difficult. And again, we talked about that a little bit earlier. It's doable. You just got to be ready. And another person said, you sure you want to know? I don't have children, but several feel I could be autistic and my list would be longer than my list of toys that I'd want uh, that I'd make out for Santa. Transitions are hard for all of us. And I think it's important to recognize it, embrace it and go, OK, it's hard. What do, what tools do I have in my tool belt that will make it easier? Well, I know that if something is rewarding, we're more likely to do it on a regular basis. So transitioning easily, uh, we're more likely to do it if it's rewarding. So make sure that you're rewarding yourself and you're rewarding your children. I mentioned at the start of the show that when Jem was in therapy, I would uh, be in another room listening on the monitor, watching on the monitor, and I was trying to get work done as well because I needed to make some money from home. And it was, it meant two new jobs that I wasn't trained in, being able to do those while I was listening. It was not the ideal situation for me. And it was very difficult when that would change and it would be time to come out and take over, have the transition from just the therapist working with him to me there being with him. And sometimes I'd be in the middle of something something that it was hard to leave and to come and get fully mentally present. And I was turning into a little bit of an unhappy camper because I felt like I couldn't get anything done. And somebody said to me, ah, because you're not making and embracing your transitions. Well, I'm sorry. What was that class in high school or college? I must have missed it. And they said, you know, your brain is involved in doing one thing and it's time for it to go and do something else. And it, there is a process by which you can make it easier for yourself. And, you know, you could give yourself a countdown like we give our kids, but, you know, who's thinking of that in the minute? And sometimes you're surprised as an adult. Oh, it's that time already. And so a very quick thing that we can do is to change our physical state and then our mental state changes. So if you have to make a quick transition from one thing to another, uh, something that you can do is do five quick jumping jacks and you'll see that the transition, getting your mind out of one thing and into another one is much quicker. Sometimes when my child is playing a video game and he gets very intensely into the video game and I'll say it's time for this to happen, I can see that his brain is still in that that space if I ask him to do something physical uh, and sometimes I just make something up uh, you know like hey help me you know to stretch and you know show me how tall you can reach or whatever or ask him can you run upstairs and get me this really quick the act of going up the stairs really quickly releases his brain from the video game try it don't take my word for it and it's not something I invented it's something that somebody else told me about to be able to change change from one task to another and to get your mind present with what you need to do. Let me know if it works for you. Uh, fair enough. We have to take a couple of minutes here at the end of the show to talk about what's happening the rest of the week. So tomorrow, 
Dr. Doreen Grampache will be with us tomorrow. We are doing a live show tomorrow, so we've got a bunch of questions. If you want a question answered, please write it in right now because I'm going to compile the questions for tomorrow uh, in just a little while. Write that in and you'll have the opportunity to talk to her in real time tomorrow during Ask Dr. Doreen. Then in the second hour, Nancy Allspot Jackson will be joining me for a segment we call Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. We have a very special guest tomorrow who's going to be talking about a very specific kind of therapy that involves animals and helping children and adults with special needs to uh, experience the bond between a human and an animal and how productive that can be. And you might be thinking to yourself, oh, it sounds a little airy-fairy. Well, not really. There's some, some, some research to substantiate that for a lot of our kids they find animals very reinforcing and there's a ton of, re uh, of research about when you find something that's reinforcing how much better the results are going to be when you're trying to teach a new task. So I don't think it goes all that uh, you know into airy fairyland to assume that if a child finds interacting with a dog or with a horse really reinforcing that we're going to see a change in behavior when we give them access to to those kinds of animals, especially horses. There's something majestic about horses. And I know Nancy's been going through something recently where she is going to, uh, it looks as though she's gonna be donating her horse uh, two of her horses to an organization to help with these kinds of therapies and she's got a really amazing story um, that she can tell about that as well. So we'll have a guest tomorrow who's gonna be talking about that and if you've ever thought She's going to be telling us about how it can be used in conjunction with ABA and how complementary it can be. Emily's cycling through some of the ways that you can get in touch with us. I also want to remind you that in two weeks' time, our very special guest during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy is going to be Vin DeBona. He is the executive producer of shows such as America's Funniest Home Videos. He's being honored coming up at the Denim and Diamonds Award Dinner for Act Autism Care and Treatment Today act today and so he will be with us live in the studio that's two weeks from tomorrow you're not going to want to miss that and then on Thursday we we start our cavalcade of BCBAs who are going to be with us the rest of the week Angela Persicky will be here on Thursday on Friday Dr. Adele Nadowski and Dr. Jonathan Tarbox we are going to get your questions answered one way or the other so uh, I want to remind all of you thank you for being with us and for being patient about getting those questions answered again tomorrow Dr. Doreen Grambache I always leave this towards the end, but I want to know, we're about to do participate in a research study, and we have some free Rokus to give away to individuals who will agree to participate in the study. What it means is you'll have to watch our program and some other programs having to do with autism that we think very highly of. So if you would like a free Roku, I would like for you to please write to us. You can do it at autismlive at gmail.com and let us know that you'd be interested in participating in the study. You'll watch and then you'll be part of a focus group to talk about what you saw in a month or so time. So if you want a free R R Roku, uh, write to us and we'll give you the details, see if it works out. We have a certain number of them to give out and they will be given to you to keep even after the study is over. We're out of time. We'll see you tomorrow. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.